Hi, welcome to Touch by Grace. I'm here with my friend, Janae Shanahan, and uh, we're going to hear her story about how Jesus has touched your life by grace. And so it's always great to start with some background. And uh, did you grow up in the Idaho Falls area, Janae? No, I was actually, <clears throat> excuse me, born and raised in Rigby. Okay. In fact, I was actually born in a little maternity home that's just only about seven houses down from where I live now. So I've been in Rigby all my life. I, we moved to Boise, my ex-husband and I, for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And outside of that, I've always been in Rigby. So A Rigby girl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the older I get, the more I like that little town. You like it. <laughs> and I like that little small town. <laughs> so. Like most uh, small towns, there's times when you think, oh, I, wish I should have moved away from here. But as you get older, you're just comfortable with it. and. Mm-hmm. And so you went to all your school years, and how long were you in Boise? For just a couple of years. A couple of years. Uh-huh. Yeah, back in the early 80s. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so. then came back here. Mm-hmm. And so uh, did you, what was your family like? Did, they, uh, did you grow up, um, what kind of spiritual background was in your family? What, what you describe what Janae's family mm-hmm. experience was. My family was, uh, we had a small family. It was my, my mother, my father, and my sister and I. And um, my mother's side of the family, which is the side that we stayed fairly close to, mm-hmm. was very active in the LDS church. My father's side of the family was very business-oriented. And mm-hmm. th- that part, I, there may have been members of the church, but they didn't practice mm-hmm. any sort of religion at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, thinking about that, I think... My dad's religion was his business, basically, and mm-hmm. and he was uh, he was an old military. He had, he was in the Korean War, so he was involved in the VFW, and um, so a lot of his friends and a lot of the associations and families that we associated with were work types of people and social type of people, not so much the um, religious. I see. Sort of, you know, we didn't have that so part was, of the life. What was the business that he was in? He in? actually had the title the title company in Rigby, the oh, okay. land and development company there. So he, my grandfather had had it as an abstractor, mm. and then my father bought it, and it was that's what he did and retired from until oh, he I sold see. it. Okay. Yeah. And so um, did you grow up, since that was kind of the family dynamic, uh, one side of the family was committed LDS and your dad's side not not so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you uh, do primary? Were you connected more with the LDS church and yeah. grew up going to all those things? Yeah, we did. You know, okay. we did. We practiced and he didn't not, he didn't um, discourage us from going. He just wasn't a participant himself. And so mm-hmm. this the, there was a struggle there in that my mom was very committed in her youth and mm-hmm. as as she grew older and after they got married she kind of veered away a little bit because mm-hmm. dad wasn't at practicing and so there was um we would go to primary we'd go to mutual and of course the schools that I was involved in all of my girlfriends everything that we did in Socially. the town was yeah. pretty much was pretty much evolved around the church and the practice mm-hmm. and you know the standards of the church and and so I didn't probably ever really understand fully mm-hmm what I was practicing or what the beliefs were. I right. just knew that, you know, that that's where we went. And that mm-hmm. if we went to church, that's where we went to church. And we did the social things with the, with the church. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, it's very much um, socially the whole dynamic of life mm-hmm. in a small town mm-hmm. in eastern Idaho. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so as you uh, got older and you graduated, you had friends that were going on missions and... Um, was it as common then uh, for your girlfriends to go on a mission? No. No. Not it that. was more, it, I mean, yeah. it is a little more now, but back then mm-hmm. it doesn't seem to be, it was more just the boys. Right. It, right. Was, the, it was more the boys. And, and you know, more of the, the girls would were more waiting for the missionaries to come home. To come home. And that home. was kind of the goal. And right. To marry a missionary. To marry a the missionary. missionary. When they, yeah, when they came home. Um, I had, I, I, honestly, I, I was never, um, I never felt a real commitment. I I, I knew that that's where we went, but I didn't. I didn't have a commitment there. I didn't feel that commitment. I um, just knew that. I mean, if there was any involvement, that's where we went. But mm-hmm. um, my mother struggled quite a bit with her emotions all the time I was growing up, and my father was. They they were good parents, and we had everything we always needed. But he had a real problem with alcohol, so mm-hmm. there was there was always that dynamic and that kept me a little separated from, Mm -hmm. you know, we could go do things with people, but it was one of those things where um, a lot of times either there was, 
there was a hesitation Mm -hmm. from some of my girlfriends' parents to let them actually come and stay or for us to do a lot of things. And so um, I kind of, I I didn't really have that connection with the church. I didn't understand that as a a young girl. I didn't understand how come um, there was a different there was a different way that I was treated versus what other families sure. were that were very active, the full family, you know, mm-hmm. when everybody goes and, and is involved and has leadership roles in there and all. It, it, there was a difference. Right. So, so did, was that a <clears throat> struggle in the home with that alcohol or alcoholism? Mm-hmm. Or, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was hard. Um, I, uh, I always knew that there was God. We always, I always knew, I always knew that there was God for some reason. I mean, that was one thing. My, like I said, my folks taught us to be good citizens. My mother always taught us we never say the Lord's name in vain. Yeah. <laughs> there were those kinds of things that we were taught. A sense of morality. A sense of morality, right? Yeah. Um, but we had a series of deaths when I was young. I was like eight. My grandfather died, and the next summer I had an aunt that was that passed away and left her four children. And then the next yeah. summer I had my sister was killed in a car accident. So. From the ages of eight to ten, every summer we were we were mourning someone's death, and I um, I think my sense of God and 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 the Lord came then when I knew that I had all these people that I had lost, and I knew they were there was too much. They made these people were too too big in my life to just be gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, in the LDS Church, at least what I had understood was that everyone goes to heaven. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone goes to heaven, and so I had developed this. Un- question in my mind as to I didn't ever understand why Jesus had to die mm-hmm. because um, everyone goes to heaven and right. there's only certain things that a person could do that would cause them not to go to heaven and mm-hmm. and so in my mind all the time that I was growing up it was always about you either went to heaven or if you committed a murder or killed someone you went to hell I see. so as a young child that was kind of always the way mm-hmm. I interpreted mm-hmm. The afterlife, and I always felt like everyone was was going to go to heaven. So, tell me about your sister in the car wreck. What happened? Um, we were how, actually how, is she older sister? She was, yeah, she was four years older. Okay. She was my older sister. So okay. she was really through the through the alcohol, through mm-hmm. the some of the emotional issues that we had, and the just you know dysfunction. Everybody's mm-hmm. got their own yeah. source of dysfunction, mm-hmm. but ours was there. Um, she was my strength, you know. Mm-hmm. She was kind of the one that did never do anything wrong, and she had all the answers to everything, and so mm-hmm. she was really my stability. Mm-hmm. Um, but my mother and I had gone to a primary function, and as we were walking out of the church, we had a police officer come and, and pick us up and, and let us know that she'd been in a car accident. So she had just, I don't know, she'd maybe had her license, you know, she was 14, so she'd barely. Oh, wow. And they, she was just taking a girlfriend home, and they had a the tire blew out on the car and and so she flew out and hit the bridge and wow. and uh, and she was gone you mm-hmm. know and so what about the girl that was with her she was injured but she was but she but she was okay, okay. You know, she was in fact yeah i've i've had since had time to visit with her in the recent years and oh, wow. and that was something that god did so yeah yeah you know he brought something about there to to give us both peace about that so if she was a source like an older brother or sister is sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was that void like for you? I mean, just that, that was that's probably where things really changed. You know, mm-hmm. things really changed. I used to be a very outgoing. In fact, I was kind of the. I think my folks would say I was the I was the problem child, <laughs> and she was very very conforming. And she just like I said, she was you know. So I was. Mm-hmm. I think there's maybe some survivor's guilt that you go through with something like that, and you mm-hmm. you realize that they. You're the one they got stuck with. <laughs> you know, you're here and she's gone, and and there was that. I, I guess I changed a lot. Mom said I changed overnight, that, and I and I became very um, self conscious, and I became you know very um, just not all my boldness was gone. You know, and yeah. I, I was afraid to to um, I don't know. It just it just changed it just changed how I felt about myself. Like a new insecurity mm-hmm. without the security of your mm-hmm. sister being yeah. there. Because mm-hmm. yeah. I could come home and ask her, or she would tell me this, or, you know. Yeah. And, and she school was, and she was and gone. All, mm-hmm. all of that. Mm-hmm. Huh? Wow. Mm-hmm. And how did yeah. it affect you? Because a lot of times when um, parents lose a child, that really upends them in such a way that oftentimes marriages don't last because mm-hmm. of the, the sorrow or grief. What happened? And there's changes going on in you, but no doubt your mom and dad are yeah. facing some. Yeah, they, um, you know, it was it was one of those things with mom where she had had some emotional problems. They were very concerned about how that was going to impact her, and and she did very well through that. My 
Dad actually had harder problems. He talked about later it was really difficult for him. Um, and, you know, we always, I don't know, we always just in big things like that, that's when God would come into the picture. That's when God would be discussed at the mm-hmm. house, that God had a different plan. And, mm-hmm. and that was kind of those little, that's, that was things like that that brought that moment of, mm-hmm. let's, let's talk about God here. Mm-hmm. But um, we just always felt like she was being protected, you know, and she did get through it. It's She did get through it okay. But there were years and years of, um, you know, birthdays and, um, yeah. you know, just year everything. after year. Yeah, th- yeah, those first, well, yeah. you know, actually I guess the first four or five years were were really difficult. Um, and there was always that sense of, you know, there's just the void. Mm-hmm. And things were different. The dynamics were different. I remember as a kid um, in Christmas, at Christmas time, Terry would never, her, my sister's name was Terry, and she would never, um, Christmas morning we'd wake up and, We'd wake up before mom and dad, and I'd want to go out. She'd say, we have to wait for mom and dad. <laughs> so, so we'd get in bed, and we'd play cards, or we'd do something, wait for mom and dad to get mm-hmm. up. And so, you know, it was that kind of guidance that mm-hmm. she provided to me mm-hmm. that was gone, and I just kind of felt like I floundered yeah. for a long time trying to figure out what I was, because we didn't have a lot of, um, we didn't have, we didn't have the guidance that the Lord provides. We didn't yeah. have that kind of guidance right. in my home. Mm-hmm. So we just did you know the legal things, the right things that we knew of, and mm-hmm. and then when it came to stuff like that, I I just kind of had to observe other people to figure out what what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> so, you know, because you you do feel very much alone. Yeah, yeah. So you fast forward, you get to the place of uh, uh, you're out of school. Are you like all your friends? You're waiting for the return missionary. To no, marry or? I actually kind of took a turn, and I was sort of a little partier the last couple of years of my high school years uh-huh. my, my my senior year we you know I got out early on my senior year and my my folks had never geared me to that mm-hmm. so much my dad was always when you grow up and go to college so I was always kind of on that track college that I was going to go to school I was yeah. going to go to college so after high you? school yeah. I did I, I went to CSI I went to college of southern Idaho mm-hmm. and um I started and and then we you know, then I got messed up with different people, and then I so I quit, and then I started through the Votech down there, and then, and while I was there, that's where I met my um, my husband at the time. Okay, he was from he was actually from from Haley or from Burley, uh-huh. and so he was in Twin Falls, and so I'd met him, and then we ended up getting married, and so the the college there at that point stopped pretty quick, and and so we I was married at the age of twenty, mm-hmm. so. Yeah. And then you, uh, how long until you had kids? I, I was, I, it was about seven months. <laughs> about seven months, okay. <laughs> so, so anyway, yeah, we, we, had, we had to get married. Mm-hmm. And so I had my little guy, Chris. Um, and when that happened, my whole attitude of who I wanted to be and how I wanted to be, the kind of person I wanted to be changed right. because I had this little baby. I wanted, to, I wanted to take care of him the way he needed to be mm-hmm. taken care of. But... Mm-hmm. Kids was, do that. They, they do that. Yeah, it, wouldn't, it makes us grow <laughs> they do, up like, they do. All, it's like oh, overnight. Now I have this little yeah. yeah. So I changed, and mm-hmm. and and my my ex husband at the time didn't really understand how come I changed. How come I didn't want to go party anymore? Why didn't I want to go do these things? Because before the child, that's what you were yeah, doing. Yeah, you know, because we were just just out there having yeah. a ball, I guess, yeah. just you know, drinking and uh-huh. and just doing what we wanted. And so um, and so when that happened, that put a real strain on our marriage because. Mm-hmm. You know, I may have, I don't know if I paid too much attention to the baby. I don't know, but Mm -hmm. he was my little, you know, he was Mm -hmm. my little ball of joy there. And Mm -hmm. and I was very proud of him. And Dave, he, I don't know, we we tried. Um, We were actually married and divorced twice. We were married for five years, and we were divorced for two, and then we were remarried for three. And then, and that's been... 22 years ago, so right. so it's been... And did you stay down in the Twin Falls area through that time? No, we no. moved up here. Okay. We, we did live up here in Rigby, and actually mm-hmm. he worked. He ended up going to work for my father. Oh, wow. And so he worked for him and learned the business up there, and, mm-hmm. um, and I kind of stayed home. And then when we went through our um, first divorce, through that period of two years, I ended up going out to the Botech and, and got a you know, certificate in office occupations and and then I started going and working with dad up there at the office and so um you know it just it it just didn't work out between us mm-hmm. it was he had other interests and I um I uh couldn't go along with a lot of what he agreed with and then there were other there were others there were just other 
other people that came into the picture that, you know, I said I felt like an old lady at the age of 29 because there was always somebody that was 10 years younger. <laughs> so yeah. there was that. There was that part of our marriage that, that really caused it to fail was just other relationships. And, and yeah. um, so anyway, so. So uh, now you're a single mom and you've got Chris and Chris stays with you. You have custody. And, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and, uh, and so we move ahead. Um, now up until this point, um, you haven't really committed your life to Jesus, mm-hmm. like we've talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to move ahead to that place that that life really changed mm-hmm. with what happened with Chris okay. and things. And it was it um, after that you came to the Lord, or before that? Because I'd like to mm-hmm. talk about that. That was it part was, of that. It was part. Of, yeah, okay. that, it was right. that. That is what brought me to the Lord. Okay. It was. That. So let's talk about so, that. Then. Okay. And I have to add, I did have one other little baby in there. I had my little daughter Megan. So you I've did? got two children. Okay. I have two children, and so she was born. Um, she was born before our, you know, before our, our second. Mm-hmm. She was born in that period of the five years. So, anyway, oh, okay. just so, so I do and, have two children. Yeah, so I have how old is Megan? She is twenty nine now. Mm-hmm. She's she's three years younger than Chris. So mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So and so that they is, are, is she here or she and her husband live in Meridian. They have okay. three little kids. So so yeah. you got some grandkids. So I have grandkids. Yeah, that, that's yeah, fun. And they're, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So anyway. so. Uh, Chris is a senior in high school. He's actually is a fifteen year old oh, sophomore. Fifteen year old sophomore. He's fifteen. Yeah, okay. he was fifteen. So tell Chris, me what happened. Um, Chris and Megan, of course, you know, growing up in a single parent home in a small town in that area is is, is difficult. And and um, he always wanted to be accepted. I think he, his his. You know, it was just he was kind of in that same way that I was in that we were in a community where a lot of his friends were in very active families. And mm-hmm. um, and he was not only from a non-active family, but he was from a divorced family. And um, and so he started active, struggling active, in the, active L- in the LDS, LDS faith. Church. Yeah, we, you know, we didn't go to church. People might watch your story and not live in our <laughs> area, true, and so they don't, they don't even know that's you're true. They're that's, active. That's true. They're, they're, active. they're, active. <laughs> <laughs> they're active in the LDS because okay, 98% right. of Rigby yeah. is, is LDS, right. you know, for the most part. At least sure. that used to be the way. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, um, he really, really wanted to fit in, and he really wanted to be into sports. He really was not real real athletic he did try and try and try to play ba- basketball and you know he was in he was in baseball and he was in football and he was he was but he really wanted to to fit in and be a part of what all of his friends and he looked sure. up to all of his friends um chris was diagnosed also with clinical depression through a lot of uh, what, what, from about the time that he was 12 mm-hmm. um we had started realizing and and i i look back now and i think well I really think what it was was we just had this dysfunction. You can't be mom and dad, and you you try to be both, but you can't be. And so there was a dysfunction, and yeah. and um, our home life looked different than others. We didn't have everything that a lot of other people had, and mm-hmm. so he was trying to. He wanted to fit in. Um, he uh, he just he got involved with with started to get involved with drugs, <clears throat> and I know that he was. Um, started get, getting involved with marijuana and started drinking a little bit. He had friends that were, they were all good kids alone and, and apart, but together they they were kind of, in fact, their class was kind of, was one of those classes that teachers two years ahead would say, they're coming, you know, mm-hmm. they're coming. They kind of had the stigma as a class. And I yeah. think at some point I think they almost thought they had to live up to that, mm-hmm. to that stigma that had been put on them as a class of, mm-hmm. of heathens, I guess you'd say. But, yeah. um, but he... He was a good kid. I mean, he I didn't ever have any trouble with him. He was a smart boy and he learned quickly and he didn't have any trouble with school or is that kind of a thing. But we started having trouble with I started having trouble with with this group of friends. I I was working and they knew my schedule and they knew when they could come. We we were we were the only ones that lived right in town. So mm-hmm. our house sort of came the you know, the congregation place for all the kids, and they'd come over at noon, and they'd come over, and they'd know when I was coming, so they'd all be gone when I'd get home, but I'd see the, you know, I'd see the results of all of them being there at the house, and and so it was kind of a struggle that way, and so I had, at this point, his dad and I had, we've, we've maintained a fairly decent relationship, and so I was talking to him about my concern, um, and he says, well, why don't you let him come down and stay with me? He was living in Twin Falls at the time, so he um, moved to Twin in January mm-hmm. and stayed down there through that period of time until about July when he came back to live with me again. Um, 
in that time, he, you know, he just missed his friends, and he still did a lot of things with his friends. But um, when he got back, he started in with them again, and they actually. Um, the first thing that he had done is he went out and, and they all got together and they went out and stole a sign and, and they all got picked up for that. And then a few weeks later they got picked up for underage drinking and then it was underage smoking and then it was just kind of this little period of time of about four months where we went from no legal issues mm-hmm. to something almost, it was just like I couldn't go to sleep at night. I was afraid that you know I was going to get a call and, yeah. and if he wasn't home I didn't know where he was. And, and it was a real struggle that way. Um, just, just, just this worry that that I didn't know what was going on with him. Mm-hmm. He was, he was kind of um, just off on his own, doing his own thing, and mm-hmm. he wasn't, he wasn't himself anymore. And uh, it happened to be the week that my grandfather passed away. We were busy that week, um, trying to prepare for his funeral, and he'd been quite involved. My father, my grandfather, in the legislature, so I was quite nervous because my cousin and I had been asked to write his his um, eulogy, and and I was real worried about that. So that whole week we. We were quite distracted by that. And, mm-hmm. and so the night of his viewing, my grandfather's viewing, Chris didn't want to go. He didn't, he, I knew he didn't want to go, um, so he'd fought me on that. So I, I kind of waited as long as I could, but we had to get up to the mortuary, and um, he never did come home. Mm-hmm. And I worried, you know, where, where is he? And um, throughout the night that night, people started talking about this incident that had taken place out to Grant and that these young boys had gone out and... And that they had actually shot and killed a clerk out there, and that they were on the run. And I, I remember my heart um, because I'd started having trouble with him. I just thought, oh, those poor parents. I can't, you know, I, I just can't imagine. Mm-hmm. And um, one of my girlfriends came through later, whose whose husband was on the police de- department, and she made the comment. Um, you know, she said, well, one of the kids was wearing a cowboy's jacket, and I stopped, and I, you know, because Chris had a cowboy's jacket, and I thought. You know, it still at that point didn't dawn on me because I'd had trouble with him, but this was something that just was never, ever in my mind. I mean, I, I had, you know, you teach your kids to do right. You teach them not to steal. You teach them to, 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 to be nice to people, not to lie. You teach them all those basics. But, you know, I never, through all the time I was raising them, ever thought I needed to point blank say, you don't kill people. And and I and I, you know, when, when, as the night went on, I I came to realize. I mean, Chris never came home, and I started frantically looking for him, and and I had this going on in the back of my mind, and I'm wondering, you know, you know, thinking, no, he, there's no way he was a part of this, and um, and I went looking all over that I could, and about you know midnight, I got a telephone call, and and um, and now I know that the Lord had His hands. And he was taking care of me through all of this. I, I did have a, a friend of mine, a, a fellow that I was dating at that time, and he was probably the only person that I knew who knew Christ in a different way than anyone I had ever known. Mm-hmm. And um, he 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 looked at things different, and he um, he he was he was there. I was able to call on him, and he was there. The police called to tell me that they figured that Chris had been involved in this in this shooting, and. You know, in the in the in my heart, I I think I knew that, but in my mind, I couldn't accept that because I just I just couldn't. Oh, I still I still yeah. can't believe it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they started looking for him, and the boys there were actually three of them, and um, you know the the story that I know of. So you know what the, the details that I know is that they had gone, they had they had left school. In fact, backing up a little bit, I remember being over to my mom and dad's house, and they lived right on the highway going out to the high school. And a little after, a little before three that day, we were all in her dining room, and I remember hearing all the sirens. I heard all the police and all this stuff stuff going on. And I remember then looking at the clock and thinking, "Ah, the kids are still in school. I don't, I don't need to worry." You know, yeah. thinking they're okay. And so we went about our day, and he never came home. And then, you know, yeah. as the day progressed, we came to understand that he was involved in this, mm-hmm. and, it, and he was a part of this. Um, and they had taken off. They were gone. We couldn't find him. Um, and they were gone for a couple of days, actually, and um, and so through that period, I, um, well, I, I, a lot of it is, a lot of it is almost hard for me to even remember because it, there was such a shock there. I mean, just this intense just the trauma, shock. I, yeah, yeah. I, I can't. I just, I just, knowing that he wasn't raised with he. 
I, I just knew you know, we didn't we didn't teach him this way. He wasn't abused. He didn't. I mean, we had our dysfunction. We, sure. I mean, we didn't have. But I just couldn't understand how all of this came about. Um, and so over the course of the next week or so, you know, there, there was a couple of days that went on, and the boys finally started coming back. They came back, and and they were picked up in Salt Lake or in Utah in uh, one of the canyons there, mm-hmm. and that's where they were taken into the Salt Lake or into the Utah jail. Mm-hmm. Um, in that time frame, there was just a lot that went on, um, and we. we one of the boys that was a good friend of Chris's that was involved in it, his mother happened to be um, a Christian. And they had a pastor that they knew that was out in Roberts. And mm-hmm. and her boy actually asked if um, if he would come and pastor Chris because he knew he needed help. I, mm-hmm. I didn't get to see Chris for a few days, and I didn't get to actually even hug him for mm-hmm. a few weeks. And it was so difficult. I remember the first night we went up to the jail to finally see him and and it was in their old jail and it was this little teeny window and and you know here he sat this young man who was so he was 15 years old he he was in this he had no he was just in this no clue of what he had done the the devastation he really didn't understand why he had done what he had done um, the devastation what it, you know he just didn't understand the reality of it all um, and I was. What happened uh, at the event itself, Janae? They well, went to a convenience store. They went to a convenience store. They they in started Grant. in Grant. Yeah. They robbed. They they were getting gas. They went into the store, and um, uh, it's Chris and two friends. It's Chris and two friends. One stayed in the car, though. One of his mm-hmm. friends stayed in the car. Then the other friend went in with him, and um, there was a, a gun? there was a Ooh. they 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 actually the boys had gotten together, and one of the other boys' family. Had guns, so they they ended up going all over the place. I think they they had gone out to one of the friends and got gas, and they'd gone so that they could get their gas tanks or their gas containers. Mm-hmm. They'd gone to another friend and gotten a gun. They actually sawed it off. You know, they'd seen one of the things that came out um, later, and I don't know how much impact it had, but they had they had spent some time watching a movie a couple of times. Um, there were people who really felt it, that that had a huge impact on what they had done because evidently the whole routine of what they went through was just very close to what was in that movie. And so I, I think, I don't know if that's where they got the, Idea the, plan, or the plan or whatever. But, they sawed um, off a shotgun? But they sawed off a shotgun okay. and, they, um, and, they, and they took this shotgun and they had other guns with them too. Um, what Chris will tell me has has told me since then, and and even right afterwards, was that you know they, it started out being a big talking sort of thing. He wanted um, to be accepted, and he had a little small group of people who were um, kind of egging him on, and they mm-hmm. were kind of talking about this, you know, how they will be at fifteen and and talking big. Um, and as the day progressed, things started to happen to where they first they slept school, and he knew he was going to be in trouble for sloughing school, and he didn't know. What to, um, you know, how was he going to explain to me that he was sloughing school? So the next thing was, well, then I guess we're going to have to leave. We're going to have to run away. So if I run away, then the sloughing school thing's not going to seem, seem such a big thing. And it was just these, just this craziness, this crazy thought process that he went through. Mm-hmm. Um, of, and then they got into the store. And he had a couple of people who, they had talked about this. I guess they had talked about this the night before, from what I understand. And there were a couple of people who were really egging him on who really wanted to see this thing happen, you know, to mm-hmm. see this. And and the plan was to go out and to shoot the clerk. I, I don't I don't know why that was the plan. I don't know how come that had to be a part of the plan other than like and I've I've never watched this other movie, but I don't know if that was part of the plan in this mm-hmm. movie. I don't know what it was, but it was all this this big talk scheme of what we were going to do. And he said as time went on, just one thing after another, and he'd, they'd, they'd do one thing, and then he'd be afraid that he couldn't face up to that, so he had to do the next thing, and then he had to do the next thing. And and so he did. He went into the store, and he he point-blank shot um, Mrs. Tomchak in the back of the head. Mm-hmm. And um, there was no reason for it. There was nothing. Um, in fact... And, I mean, he had he had only been to the store I think once before. He wasn't familiar with that particular mm-hmm. store. He, it was just part of this 
plan that craziness they, yeah. that they had that they had conjured up and then it was did they like they robbed the store they did they yeah, robbed the store yeah. i think i can't remember i think they i was like for very small i mean nine i can't even remember it was yeah. like 90 to 100 dollars i mean it was a very minimal amount they stole the gas they got in the car they ran and it was more about there's witnesses there was a wo- there was a woman there there was a the woman store. there when when they came in she was walking out um mm. If I remember it right, yeah. she was walking out of the store, and she just remembered looking at the boys and the looks that they gave to her, and that the looks were just mean. You know, they they were just they were scary, and that they they didn't they didn't respond to her like you would a normal mm-hmm. you know seeing a person and all. And she felt uncomfortable with that, and she left. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was no one there when they went into the store. It was after she she mm-hmm. left before they had gone into the store, um, and then and they left. Um, mm-hmm. He still to this day doesn't really understand um, why he would have gone through with something like that, why he would have done it, why he even wanted to do anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, he was 15. He was 15. And he, uh, you recently shared with me that one or two of the boys have been released. Mm-hmm. Because they all, they all, what were they all sentenced to? They, yeah, they were all sentenced. They were. It was actually, um, it was actually right after they had just changed the law in Idaho that that for kids that, that committed certain types of crimes, uh, capital offense especially, would be tried as an adult. Mm-hmm. So all three of them were tried as adults, um, and they were all found guilty. Chris was found guilty of uh, first degree murder and robbery, and um, the other two. Were one was one was charged with murder and robbery, and the other one was charged with robbery. Um, if I remember right, anyway, they were charged. One of them had fifteen year sentence. One of them had a twenty five year sentence, and Chris was given a thirty five year sentence. Mm-hmm. So he's he's in his sixteenth year now mm-hmm. of his sentence. So he's thirty one. He's, he's thirty two now. Thirty two. He just he turned thirty two okay. in January. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. So so he's been there. For more now than he was home, you know. We, and one boy's been released, or, or one two boy's years? been released, okay. and the other one still has another ten years, a little, a little under ten years, I guess. And were all three of them in the same, uh, the Idaho State Prison in Boise? They, um, they had them. They sent all of them. Well, the, for the first, because they were they were juveniles, mm-hmm. they had them in the county facilities for mm-hmm. the first almost two years. So. Mm-hmm. Um, they were 17 when they, one of them was a little older, one of them was was 18 when they were actually taken to the adult mm-hmm. facility in mm-hmm. Boise. Mm-hmm. And that's where they started. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the, the one that's actually been released at this point, he, they ended up taking him to um, northern Idaho. Um, I can't remember the name of the facility there. Um, so he ended up doing his time there. Mm-hmm. And then the other two, Chris and, and Tom, were both in, mm-hmm. in Boise now they've they've moved them around a little bit they've been to different facilities you know the the mm-hmm. state has has shipped them off to Oklahoma or shipped them off to some other places for a time yeah. period but mm-hmm. but as far as I know they're both still they're both in Boise now mm-hmm. I know Chris is and I think Tom is mm-hmm. too so yeah. yeah so the I mean trauma in the small town mm-hmm. uh, first of all you're a mom so you're devastated because you can't even you can't even process this mm-hmm. information what's happened Mm-mm. and then um, Everything that's played out as the trial and, and and all of those things. How did all of that stuff bring you to this point of of turning to the Lord? And what were this kind of your thought process? And who did the Lord have in your life to how you come to know Jesus in a personal way? I um like I said I I you know we had this one this one pastor who who had taken it in his heart to, to go up and pastor with, to, uh, with Chris and to mm-hmm. minister to him, which he did. And I, and I was fascinated by that because we were, you can imagine it. I, I, now I, he's from Roberts. Was this Charlie Roberts. Scott? It was Charlie Scott. Oh, Charlie yeah, Scott. Charlie yeah, Scott. I know Charlie. Yeah, Charlie. Okay. Yeah, Charlie. So there's and, not many pastors in no. Roberts. So <laughs> Charlie Scott was yes, the only one. He was, yep. Okay. It was Charlie Scott. And, yeah. um, and uh, he, he went up and, and visited with Chris. And, and I remember as we were trying to go through all this and, and um, you know, I still trying to understand because, like I said in the back in my background, I still had this. I believe in God. I don't understand what's going on. But one thing I did, one thing I did have is this fear that Chris has lost his soul because mm. in my mind, mm. yeah. uh, 
he's done the one thing that's going to take you to hell. I mean, I didn't know of anything else that would, would send you to hell, and that here we were. It would be the unforgivable sin. It was sin. the unforgivable yeah. sin he had committed. Um, so that was in the back of my mind, um, trying to understand why, why we were here. I went up to visit Chris one day, and Charlie had, Pastor Scott had been up there with him, and you know, behind this window, Chris just looked at me, he said, Mom, you have to find Jesus. You know, Pastor Scott says he can forgive me. And um, that was my first connection with why Jesus had to die, because I, as a child growing up, I, I never really understood that, because we we um, pretty much learn to take care of ourselves. You do what you can, you know, and God helps those that help themselves. And so it was just the big things that God came into the picture in. And mm-hmm. and I, this this Jesus part, I, I believed in Jesus as a brother, as a figure, mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. but I really never understood how come if God was so big and he could take care of everything and he, he was everything. I just didn't understand how Jesus, why his death came into things, because I, I was really never taught that. Right. Um, at that point, he, it clicked. And here's your son that has just committed murder, saying, Jesus can forgive you, Mom. You need to know Jesus. Mm-hmm. And yes. so it's, I mean, if you look it's, at it from that perspective, it's a, it, it's a pretty radical uh, picture y- yes. of a mom who's never done anything like this mm-hmm. and a boy who realizes his sins, he realizes he, he needs forgiveness, mm-hmm. he realizes yeah. uh, all of those things because she, Charlie's sharing the gospel he, yeah, that Jesus did, died yeah. for our yeah. sins and rose from the dead. And He did. He, he comforted him. He was, he, was the only, um, he was the only person, not only you know, the, the fact that he brought Jesus to light for us, quite honestly, he was the one who comforted us. He was the one who, he was the person who had it in his heart to share a love Mm. When there was so much hate, you know, mm. the hate, um, which was justified in my mind, I knew, I mean, here we were in this horrible place and, and this senseless murder and people had lost people they loved and it was hard to understand and the, and the hate was justified and whether it was as, you know, whether it was magnified in my own mind more than it was, there were, the, there were some that would come and, and try to comfort, you know, and try to support but it's really hard to support something like that. Um, yeah. It's really hard to, to come, and even though you feel badly, it, it was very difficult for those people to come and, and just want to let us know that they were supporting us mm-hmm. because there wasn't anyone in the communities. I mean, you think that mm-hmm. there were three boys and they all had families, and and um, and Mrs. Tomshock and her family was very well known and very good people and various, you know, everything I'd understood. I didn't know them, but I but I've heard and I and I understand that they were very loved. Loved mm-hmm. people, and she was a very kind and godly woman. Um, there wasn't anyone in that area that didn't know somebody who wasn't affected by it. Um, now, were your folks uh, are they are your folks still alive? My, well? Yeah, my father he he passed away in two thousand six, but yes, they were they were both still alive. My, like I said, that that week, my grandfather, my mother's father, had passed away, so okay. we were in the midst of his funeral um, that that Friday when it happened, that Saturday. Um, it, it turned out that I didn't go to the funeral, and, and, and so my dad stayed home with me, and he, you know, we sat at the table and tried to figure out mm-hmm. what went wrong. Um, yeah. And so they, they kind of went on, but there was a lot of, there was so just a lot going on. That was your that only kind frame. of support, in a sense, mom and dad. Yeah, was right? mom and dad, yeah, yeah. And that was hard for them. My dad was, um, my dad was devastated as, as he had, really, he had become the father figure to my kids. You know, mm-hmm. he had tried to step up and be that mm-hmm. dad that they, because Dave didn't live in the area and he he wasn't that involved mm-hmm. uh, on a on a regular basis with them, mm-hmm. and so dad was, dad took it very personally and his he couldn't understand either why 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 would he do something like this because yeah. we had tried, you know we had tried mm-hmm. to um, raise him with good values and with morals and and um, I know now I look back yeah. and I know what was missing I sure. I know what was missing but at the time we just it was just hard to understand. Mm-hmm. Um, but as time went on and the, and, and we had the courts and the, and I felt, uh, there was a couple of things that happened that I look back now and I realize, and I don't even know, I, I wished I, I wished I knew how to even make contact, but I, I don't for sure. Um, mm-hmm. there was one part of the, of the Tom Talk family who, who after one of the court hearings, they, they came up with their pastor in a group and they, they had their pastor come to me and, and say, they just want you to know that they forgive him. And and that was like huge, even though I didn't really understand the mm-hmm. 
I didn't really understand what that would mean to me, but at the right. time, it was mm-hmm. you know it was that act of them coming forward and wanting to let me know from that angle that they were that they were forgiving. They were trying to find it in their hearts mm-hmm. to forgive. Um, and then there was the other part of the family who were obviously very devastated and um, angry and wanted no part of our asking for forgiveness it was sure. just it was just a, it was just a horrible time for everybody that was involved in it mm-hmm. um the courts went on for a long time you know this the the there it was a, about an 18 month period well it was 18 months while they went through the the courts and and chris and and the other younger boy didn't have they didn't go to trial but one of them did so that's that was kind of this time frame and chris had pleaded guilty and the other ben had pleaded guilty and tom was was in court, and so during that time frame, it took a long time to get through all that, and there was just a lot of, you know, just going to the courts and mm-hmm. and being there. And I did have my mom and dad's support. Um, they're gone. They they used to leave for part of the, um, the winter time, and so that first year they were there. The second year, and and it just seemed like every time we turned around, there was a there was a new mm-hmm. this, and they had to get through all the legal things that go on. And the attorneys were trying to make sure they covered all their bases and had the whatever appeals or whatever things had to take place in a certain time frame. So it was just a hard, it was just a hard, it was just hard. Mm-hmm. It was hard to go up there and be in the community and, and the shame. You know, it's hard to even imagine, it's hard to yeah. explain the shame that goes on in your heart. Um, I just remember sitting at the table and thinking about God in a way that I'd never thought of it before and realizing that if we are God's children... And I am feeling this much pain and so much shame for something that my one child had done. And I thought about how he must hurt when he sees all of his children doing things to one another. And I I just felt a little teeny bit of, I think, what he must feel when we hurt and we hate each other, um, when we do things to each other. I, I, I... I just couldn't, um, I couldn't imagine it. And it was a comfort to me Mm -hmm. because um, I realized that I only had one. (laughs) And he's got a whole world of them, you know, that he's having to watch. And and he has to see these, um, these, he has to see this happen to, to, uh, he he sees us do these things to each other. And and so it was, um, I I just, I I guess I just, I just felt like I I had just a little bit of a taste of, of that. And then I, it helped me understand better why why somebody had to die for our sins because um I would have done anything to turn that around i would have I, if I could have changed what had happened to chris 's life, thinking at this point still that he 's going to go to hell i if there would have been anything I could have done, I would have just changed it, but i couldn 't mm-hmm. and it finally resonated with me that God had because he had sent Jesus for a reason, and Jesus had died for our sins, and he had taken care of it. He'd already undone it, and I, that was my first aha moment of why. And I, I wish it hadn't have taken such a huge thing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> wish I could have understood that before, but sure. it was such a comfort to know that that's why. You know, Jesus, mm-hmm. Jesus, it was not just, and it was years later, I mean, over the time of years, I accepted the Lord probably first for Chris and that, that, um, just that comfort in, in knowing that God had taken care of, of it and that this life would pass and there would be heaven and there would be a life after this and Chris mm-hmm. wasn't going to go to hell. He, he, he had been bought with the blood of Christ and that mm-hmm. he had taken care of this problem um, mm-hmm. and all of our sins. But it was over the next few years that he helped me see my own need. I mean, I, 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 um, I still struggle a lot with the shame and with my guilt as a parent and wondering why, you know, wishing that I, wishing I could have th- done things different, mm-hmm. but re- recognizing that God has a time and a plan. And mm-hmm. um, for for whatever reason, here we are, but we know him now, and so we walk with him, and we, we hope in him, and we know that he is our mm-hmm. He is our salvation and our light. As the Lord's touched your life and the hopes that he's given you, even though there's still, there still is the struggle of this past, what, what would life be like without Jesus stepping into your life now. I mean, yeah. in the years and years of, you know, that heaviness, that mm-hmm. that shame. And I don't um, know. I've thought about that. I don't know. I I don't know where I would be. I I, I wonder if I would be. I I don't know. I, yeah. you know, um, 
I like like I said, along with the with that kind of a thing, there is such hate. Um, there is such a hate that's that's such a such a hard thing that it that it um, is something that I don't ever 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 want anyone to ever have to feel that hate. And um, I look to that, and I just have to remember that. I have to remember that I don't I don't want. I want him to be able to love through me. Yeah. Um, I want to be able to love f- for him because um, I don't want anyone to ever have to feel that hate. Um, I, I don't know if I would be here. I don't know if I would have gone up. I mean, I have I have a tendency to be. I mean, I and God has delivered me from a lot of things. He's delivered me from a lot of things. Um, but I do have an addictive personality, and mm-hmm. I, I don't know where I would be. Yeah. I, I honestly don't know where I'd be. I don't know whether I would have been uh, in into things that. You know, trying to self medicate. I don't know whether I yeah. would have, trying to you know, numb the pain just either. run, yeah. run. I, I don't know. All I know is that he picked me up, and mm-hmm. he's, and he stayed, he stayed right with me in a in a very close manner for, for years. I remember um, when I was going through the. I don't know if you remember this or not. When I went through the after we did the court thing and the boys were sentenced and off they mm-hmm. went, then came the civil suit, mm-hmm. and so there was two more years of the civil suit and I was charged. You know, I was I was a negligent mother and and it was a real hard thing for me to to deal with. And I had been given counsel because I didn't really own anything. I didn't really have anything, but I'd been given legal counsel to file bankruptcy because we didn't know what the courts might say, and I didn't really have anything, and I. I had I had come to know the Lord to the point that I had. I was trying to follow. I'd, l- I'd learned to understand that I can go to His Word to get mm-hmm. guidance. Um, and I came I came into the church mm-hmm. over on Broadway, and mm-hmm. I asked for some counsel because mm-hmm. I didn't know what to do. I mm-hmm. I didn't want to file bankruptcy. Um, there mm-hmm. was that pride thing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want I don't want to do that. Yeah. And I didn't know what to do. And you opened up the scriptures, and you um, and you you gave me that godly counsel from the Word. Um, and it turned out that God did deliver us from that out of court. It, it turned out that that's the way that worked. But I just remember um, you inviting me to come to the congregation, and um, and I I still felt very um, awkward and said, you know, I don't want to insult anyone. And mm-hmm. you said, we will love you here. Mm-hmm. And that was probably the first um, the first time anyone had ever said. Come and and we'll love you here. Jesus loves you here, and so mm-hmm. that meant a lot to me. That that was something that made me feel like I can come here. I can be with other people. They do yeah. love Jesus. I can I can come and fellowship here, and and I can do that without without fear and without apprehension. You know, yeah. not not worry. I can come here and, and be okay. Yeah. And so I I thank you for that. <laughs> I thank you a lot. <laughs> so. Well, it's you know God's love to yeah. um, reach us in. He came for us from for to deliver us from those hateful situations, those shameful situations. I mean, that's why Jesus came. And uh, and you know, even when you think about, uh, you know, parenting is a hard thing. Mm. And when our kids sin and fail, uh, it's so easy for us to bring that back on ourselves. And yet, the Lord, uh, I mean, the Lord's a perfect parent. And he had Adam and Eve, and they sinned in the garden, mm. and they had no bad influences. They had no, uh, they just had their own hearts. And, and I think that, uh, you know, kids have their own choices that they're making, and, uh, and we can really do the best we can, yeah. but there's no guarantee because they, they have a will of their own. And, um, uh, but just the heartbreak, and to me, just I think for any parent, this is a, such a devastating, hopeless situation until you bring the hope that Jesus can bring, the forgiveness that Jesus can bring, the love that Jesus can bring, the the um, to know that there's a future mm-hmm. that you know it's not over, life's not over. Jesus has a plan for us, and and um, and so, how did you end up coming to our church? Well, in that situation, <laughs> because were you can, were you going out to Roberts? No, actually, it was a kind of a neat thing. I, um, Pastor Scott's um, wife, Patty, and they had a daughter, Sarah. They mm-hmm. have a daughter, Sarah, who was Megan, my daughter's age. And mm-hmm. so, um, as we were, you know, he actually Pastor Scott had come and and, and kind of testified as a character witness for Chris in one of the in one of the um, tr- 
court things that we'd had. And, and we'd had kind of a get-together at my mom's house afterwards, and they came. And, and Patty asked me if I would be interested in a little Bible study. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it just worked out that, you know, she and Sarah, her daughter, came over to the house and sat with Megan and I, and um, we went through a study for... Oh, it was just a little book, mm-hmm. but it took us like six weeks, you know. Mm-hmm. And she explained that the, the acceptance of the Lord and mm-hmm. and the recognition of our sins and the fact that we that we do need mm-hmm. a Savior and and mm-hmm. that He did die for us and that mm-hmm. He did rise again. And mm-hmm. we went through all of that, and so that was kind of where I started my um, the, the the understanding of the process or the you know mm-hmm. the of the acceptance of the Lord. Um, yeah. I just I think there's just been this this grace that had been given to me that I I just had such an awareness that it was true what I had questioned all mm-hmm. this time I was growing up I I finally had understood that it mm-hmm. was true I but I had never really been taught mm-hmm. how to um go through that motion or how to go through that process of of really um mentally mm-hmm. receiving and understanding and then and then trying to um get into God's Word and to learn God's mm-hmm. Word. I mean, I'd opened the Bible up several times as a kid. Usually after we'd watched mm-hmm. a scary show, we'd, you know, yeah. it was terrible. You know, we'd go to the Bible and, yeah. and try to figure out what it was talking about. But, um, but that, that was when we, first, we were first really taught about, the, about the, just the receiving of the Lord and His mm-hmm. Word and that we could go. Mm-hmm. And, then I, and then I still hung back. I, I was still, for years, you know, um, I just didn't go out in public much. It was, it's just, it was really, really hard. And, and sometimes it's still really hard to mm-hmm. go into public not, not knowing, um, you know, how people feel. And I don't know how much of it is um, you imagine and how much of it is there. You know, your yeah. mind tends to, to really mm-hmm. go wild with what, what you might think mm-hmm. is being thought. But um, I started listening to Christian radio. Mm-hmm. And there was a, I think it was called, I think it was Cross. I can't remember Cross the radio. acronym. Yeah. yeah Cross and radio. so I listened to that for a couple of years, I think. And, and mm-hmm. it was like, they had this program on and it was so funny because I'd, I'd, I had a girlfriend at work and we would talk about things and then we'd ask a question to each other and neither of us knew. And I'd get in the car and I'd listen to this program in the afternoon and mm-hmm. They were constantly addressing these questions that we were asking. You know, it was just kind of right. like, and I'd get there the next day, and it was like, you've got to, you got to listen to this because they are, they, it was weird because it was the very same things we were asking, and it was just time after time, you know, that this, that was that would be addressed. An and yeah. It was, yeah. yeah. And so um, I listened to that, and I listened to the pastors on that, and I listened to the teachers mm-hmm. on that, and and um, and I loved it. I just, I just couldn't get enough of it mm-hmm. because it was just, it was just. Something I'd never heard before. This right. this whole different world that I hadn't ever heard of before. Mm-hmm. It it wasn't based on us, and it wasn't based on these other things, and it was real, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then they, I don't know what happened, but the radio channel went off the air, and I lost they it. They sold the radio station. They sold it. <laughs> like, is what well, happened. it was yeah. gone, and I was just kind of panicked because I, <laughs> I was that was kind of my feeding source. I didn't yeah. realize, but that's what I was just really learning by, and I happened to be out on the west side one day and I saw the dove yeah. <laughs> and I thought to myself I'll bet you know I can go in there because I knew that the, a lot of the, the programs I listened to were okay. Calvary yeah right. and I um, so I thought I'll bet you I can go in there and get the same kind of teaching that I got mm-hmm. and I went in and I first started just going to Bible studies I didn't mm-hmm. start coming to the Sunday to the Sunday mm-hmm. you know services mm-hmm. but I came to some Bible studies and I ended up taking Tammy's Healed and Set Free study yeah. after she got that going yeah. um, and th- and then I just started coming Mm-hmm. And I just because that is just like I said, I came when I talked with right. you, and and mm-hmm. and so that's how I um, that's kind of how I became aware of it. But mm-hmm. but I I was kind of brought in through that radio. I would have never known that's what was you know I wouldn't have I known see. about the teachings yeah. that were there. That it was a day to day. I mean, really mm-hmm. Bible Bible teaching. We we get into it and we actually learn what the Bible says and yeah. and and are taught from the Bible. And I had not had that before and. And that was something that I really needed. So that would have been like 14 years ago mm-hmm. or something mm-hmm. yeah, like that. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was, it was about 14 years ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you've been growing along until yeah. as we kind of wrap it up, you know, just being touched by God's grace and the peace. Um, describe uh, the peace that Jesus has brought to your soul through, I mean, really, I think um, many moms, it would be like the worst nightmare. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, there's nothing... For your child that you love so much, mm-hmm. and then this terrible um, 
event. Mm -hmm. And uh, can Jesus in his grace bring peace to a mom's heart? Yeah, yeah. You know, when Chris received the Lord, um, I think that I realized at that point that, that the success in our children's life is their knowledge and understanding of Jesus. And, and I, had, had, I had that with both my children. They had both come to a place where they had received the Lord. And I, I realized, again, that this life will pass, but as long as they know their mm-hmm. Savior, mm-hmm. they're good. They're going to they're gonna do fine. In mm-hmm. That was the peace that, that God brought, was mm-hmm. the fact that it wasn't about everything that we see. It wasn't about what we do. We didn't have to carry that burden. And it's not about our own works. It's not even about whether we're successful in what we do yeah. in this world. As long as we have him, um, he's just been, he's just become my, you know, I, I, I look to Jesus for everything. I, I, I kind of joked at one point saying, you know, I, the, the best decision I ever made I always made bad decisions, <laughs> but but the best decision I ever made was was Jesus, and and I still you know I still make those I still goof up and I still do goofy stuff mm-hmm. and I still and then I have to uh, but now I know I can go to God's word and and mm-hmm. somewhere I know I'm going to be able to find that and I can pray to God and Jesus is my personal savior and He's real and He loves me and mm-hmm. um, and He created everything. I mean, there's yeah. there's no one bigger that we that we yeah. can go to. I yeah. mean, it's just. Amen. And sometimes I'm I'm just kind of in awe. I and I and I re, have to remind myself that He does know you. You know, yeah. He does know you. You you know, you're not just forgotten there, um, because there's times when life comes along and you, and you think you're still out there doing it all on your own because mm-hmm. you you kind of forget or I I kind of forget and then I have to remember and then I. I have to come back and just be so grateful that I don't have to do it on my own. Mm-hmm. That He does want to to help me, and He does help me, and and He is He is my Savior. He yeah. is He's I, I, I joke He's my knight in shining armor. <laughs> <laughs> he's the knight in shining he armor is. that will never let he you down. He will never let me down. Yeah. He will never quit loving me, and He will yeah. always um, He will always be there. And He loves me in genuine pureness. He doesn't yeah. want any harm to me. Right. So. Right. And as people, we you know, it's just you get hurt. You do. Sure. He's the one that we can trust with everything, mm. and that's what what I read. You know, I, I think about that, and I think I can trust him with everything. I don't have to. I don't have to worry. You don't and have to he, carry it all on your own. Mm-mm. Praise the Lord. Yeah. But yeah. well, thank you for sharing your story about mm-hmm. how Jesus has touched you with His grace, and it takes a lot of courage, you know, to share painful stuff. So thank you so much, Janine. Mm-hmm.